Hello, lovely humans. I'm Wyoli, and you are listening to Sex Stories, a podcast where we interview people about their sex experiences in an effort to make the world a sexier, more loving place. And our guest today is a sensual dom and dakini, which is a tantric priestess and practitioner. She weaves the worlds of tantra and BDSM together for a deeply energetic and alchemical practice that dances between pleasure and pain, desire, longing, and heart-centered power play for full body liberation. She is a multimodality healing artist with an emphasis in sacred embodiment, tantric activation, sensation play, impact, bondage, hypnotic vocalization, and psychological play. Welcome, the incredible mistress, dominatrix, goddess, Madeline. Thank you so much, Wyo. It's amazing to be here. I am so excited to have you here. It's been a couple months coming. Can I tell people where we met? Yes, please. Okay, so... I was doing a flogging workshop at Mistress Justine's Cross Dungeon, Dungeon East in downtown LA, and I met Madeline there, and we sat next to each other, and then I got to experience, like, very, very, very happily got to experience, like, some of your skills. You have a lot of them. Thank you. Can you start out by telling our sweet listeners, if you had to rate yourself today on a shame meter with 10 being the most full of shame and one being like, what shame? Where do you fall today right now? Maybe at a two, two or three. I'm feeling bold today. I'm feeling shameless today. I'm feeling in my power. And I think any time that I sit down and talk about my work in a really cohesive way, in an intentional way, it helps drop some of that shame. That's awesome. Yeah. When in your life does it fluctuate? Like, is it higher in work, lower in work? What's it like for you? Wow. It fluctuates a lot. And I've been really bringing attention and awareness to that recently. A big point of my work is to eradicate shame. (laughs) So so I'm constantly working with my own clients around their sexual shame and where it lives in their body. And so very naturally, I'm tracking that in myself as well. Mm. And I noticed that it spikes when I talk to my parents, (laughs) when Uh I have to explain this work to my sweet sweet Southern parents from Tennessee, I noticed that I start to feel that shame pump a little bit and obviously predicated on some religious background, right? Some religious shame as well. And when I'm dating, I find it to be a complicated conversation Mm -hmm. to have with people I'm dating. And Mm -hmm. I'm still navigating how to have those conversations in a way that feels really confident without experiencing those shame spikes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in your personal life I have the same thing yeah where like as soon as it's yeah. time to talk to a regular person uh, mine spikes I interview yeah. a lot of people who are like oh my shame meter goes down when it's time to talk about sex with a partner interesting and mine is like the total opposite <laughs> even with people lately where I'm like blah, 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 sex 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 and then once we start fucking I'm like <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. find it easy to hold space talking about intimate erotic things yeah. with clients more so completely yeah. I feel very low shame Mm. when I'm talking to clients. And that's where the work of going into your archetypes becomes really helpful. Like when I'm with my clients, I am in my dom or I'm in my dakini. And those archetypes are super strong. And so when I go into those spaces and I'm embodying the priestess, there's no shame there. It's, It's really open and it's really confident. I think when I have to then translate that to the secular world, right, to the everyday, to the lay person, that's when it becomes complicated because the work is complicated. The energetics are a felt experience. And so when I have to sort of translate that out and explain to people what I do in these sessions, it can be, it can get lost in translation. Absolutely. Yeah. I can really relate to that. I guess I'm embodying the not a dom or a duckini, but the podcaster, I don't know, the the curious interviewer, because I have no problem talking to people at all, and I'll get really explicit, and then, yeah. Can you tell us, did you get a sex talk or sex ed lesson or any information about consent Mm -hmm. growing up? I can't say that I got any direct information about consent, but I did get a sex talk delivered by my dad. (laughs) Oh, really? Of all people, yeah. My dad got past the baton. I don't even know how. I don't know what the inner negotiations of my family looked like, but I got my sex talk from my dad when I was probably 13, 14, somewhere early, like early adolescent into teen years in the car on the way to school oh, just like trapped trapped i mean i remember the visceral nature of like my converses up on the dashboard my pink converses and just staring directly into the shoelaces being like when will it end <laughs> and my sweet dad 
being like, you know, sex is actually kind of fun when it's with the right person. He did so good. He did an amazing job. But at that age, you can't take it in. (laughs) You can't receive it. I got the talk that maybe I needed. But I think no matter what, it's always mortifying when your parent is the one walking you through it. Was it like mostly biological or were there emotional or social components to it? Emotional and social components for sure. I think it was a long time coming for them because I was a very sexually curious child and they knew that from a young age. Mm -hmm. And so I think they wanted to make sure they were covering all their bases because I'm sure their assumption was like, we've got this child with all this erotic energy. We don't know what to do with her exactly. And now she's becoming a teenager. She's certainly going to start exploring in the next few years. So I think theirs was like a preemptive, like, let's get it under control now. It didn't work, (laughs) but but God bless them. They really tried. (laughs) Do you feel comfy saying how they knew you were an erotic child? Like a curious, because I was very curious, but I like hit a lot of stuff and I also didn't know what was sexual, but like, did they catch you doing stuff? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Man, I have never talked about that anywhere, but yes. I mean, looking back, I know that they knew. And there were moments where they would have conversations. I'll just say it. I'll tell the story. Um, my mom had a neck massager. <laughs> That's how it always goes. <laughs> Mine had one too. Yeah. <laughs> and I discovered it. Really, truly, deeply discovered it at a super young age. I mean, seven? Yeah. Eight, like that age range. And they had a talk with me during that time period about the appropriate uses of said neck massager. <laughs> and they were like, this is how this is used. And he, my dad like showed on my mom's body, like this is for our neck and our shoulders, not for other places on the body. <laughs> I just was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the second they left the house, I was like, <laughs> straight back. You're like, sorry, I'm full of my own wisdom. I get it. I'm like, you guys are missing the whole point of this massager. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to be the one to tell you, but I figured out the real way to use it. (laughs) Okay, so now, can you tell us, please, what is sexy to you? Either a personal definition Mm. or just, like, how do you understand that word? Yeah. Sexy to me, it's interesting that you asked this. I was actually recently asked this question. And where I landed is that sexy to me is all about authenticity. It's all about raw, unbridled, unedited, uncensored human expression. And that can run the gambit. Like to me, sexy can be a woman dancing in a room with her eyes closed, like just fully embodied with her own erotic Mm -hmm. essence. And it can also be someone having like that deep cathartic cry that they've needed to have. And they don't care that other people are in the room. They're just in full expression of that. I think anything that's coming out as true expression to me is like peak sexy. That's amazing. (laughs) Now, what do you think counts as sex? Mm, I think any time that you're engaging in an exchange of energy that is penetrative and moves through the body. So it doesn't have to be physically penetrative, but any time that you are in an erotic, sexual, like sacral, energetic connection, where you're passing energy through, I think that is some version of sex. I love that. I think what came up for me as you were saying that too is it's almost, there's an inherent agreement. So it's like in order for it to like really be sex, both parties have to be like, yeah, I'm engaged. Absolutely. Oh, that's hot. Whether or not there's physical involved. Love that. Okay, so now can you just give us a little overview of what your sex-related work life is like Mm -hmm. and tell us, do you identify as a sex worker? I'll start with what my work is, the basis of my work. A new title I'm trying out is called Body Alchemy. And so really using that as the umbrella thematic of everything that I do. And it's feeling feeling really good. Mm -hmm. I'm in the early stages of playing with that terminology. But it encapsulates both the Tantra work that I do and the BDSM work because it's all about heating up the body whether you're heating up the body through breath or through movement or through sexual energy, through body work, through massage, you're heating up the system like a furnace, giving it the opportunity for transformation. 
And that transformation can be full body activation. It can be orgasmic bliss. It can be sensitizing parts of yourself that were numb or blocked or stuck. And it can also be healing. It can be an activating mechanism for trauma release. And so that's sort of like the broad umbrella. But what it actually looks like in practice is working with clients in person and working with them through exercises, techniques, through hands-on massage work, through BDSM, through impact play, through all the things that you mentioned at the top of the conversation. Also working with clients virtually, teaching them how to heal themselves, how to turn your own body on and up so that you're creating these opportunities for transformative healing through sex. Oh, that's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. And do you identify as a sex worker? I think I identify as a sex educator. Love that. But I'm also trying to destigmatize the term sex worker in my own body and mind. Mm -hmm. I think when I first started this work, I was like, I'm this, not that. Mm -hmm. And now it's feeling more like semantics to me. Yeah. I think there's a negative connotation of sex work in our culture, in many cultures. And it's really imperative that that gets broken down and dissolved. And part of that work means taking ownership of the term and helping people better understand it. And so while I don't have that as the tagline, I certainly do work that involves sex, that incorporates sexual energy. And so, yeah, I like bringing illumination to the space. I love that. I'm also on my own, you know, when I was like, oh, my God, I am a sex worker. And I want to be all the sex workers. Okay, I'm going to go do. Oh, my gosh, there's still stigma. It's real. Okay. Yeah. Is there a sex story that you can share that you have encountered because of your work that you maybe never would have experienced otherwise? And, like, the sexier, the better. I don't know why this one's popping to mind for me, but in the very beginning of my work, actually, I I was very secretive about the DOM work and the BDSM side. Mm -hmm. I was at Burning Man. I was teaching a Tantra class, actually, and hadn't come out at all as a DOM. But after the class, I had a man, a bit younger than me, come up and ask me so directly, are you a dominatrix? And I was like, so taken aback. (laughs) Like, did someone tell us? Who said something to you? (laughs) And he just asked it so earnestly and looked me directly in the eye. And for whatever reason, felt emboldened in that moment to say yes. And he said, I thought so. I thought so. I could tell by your presence. And he spoke into this desire of wanting to do a session on the playa at Burning Man. And I really wasn't taking clients at that time, but again, felt compelled to say yes. So I took this young man through a multi-day scene. <gasps> I mean, I had him like just an array of tasks, right? Like I had him come back to the camp the next day to do his intake. And then I had him leave me a note on my door telling me what times he would like to come and actually have a session. And then I left a note in return that had the session. It just was an ongoing scene that lasted multiple days in this incredibly creative environment. Yeah. Burning Man is just breeding new ideas and, and strong dynamics for exploration. And then I finally did the scene with this young man. We were exploring some of his gay and vicarious fantasies oh. that he had never talked about, never spoken to friends, to lovers. And so it was really an edgy exploration for him. I identify as queer. So it was really fun for me to get to lead someone through this gateway into their queer identity and exploration. And at the end of the scene, we went through this very, you know, erotic fantasy. And then at the end of the scene, we're closing. We're sitting across from each other having a conversation. And he was like, I do identify as bisexual. I'm realizing that in this moment. And before he was very sort of focused on the fact that he was identifying as straight but wanted to explore yeah. this. And so I don't know if that's the sexiest story, but it, it was very sexy. I was going to say that's pretty it's fucking very sexy. sexy. And it was really one of these like prime examples of someone finding themselves through the exploration of the erotic, like going on this journey and then landing in a different place than where they started. It's like you said, the authenticity, like the permission to yeah. be his full authentic self. Yeah. and. I wonder how many straight, with air quotes, (laughs) dudes out there have, you know, 
at least flexibility or curiosity yeah. that they haven't explored because of stigma and culture and all of that. But mm-hmm. damn, that's hot. Yeah. Can you share any physical specifics from that one? <laughs> I can. Also, um, was it dirty? Like, yeah, like how did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we're at Burning Man, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's complicated enough to <laughs> just survive there. And so I had a lot of parameters around what I was open to and mm-hmm. also what I felt safe taking someone else through given just the environmental controls. And so I was pretty strict about no penetration, but I used a flogger mm-hmm. as an appendage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and really created like the feeling and the concept of what it would be like to be penetrated. And I had to get creative because I didn't want to cross my own boundaries and I didn't want to take someone through a more deeply penetrative and energetically intense scene than I felt like they were prepared to go through. And so I really had to play into the theater of it. Mm -hmm. I really had to say, okay, what can we do to create a scene without crossing some of these boundaries? And so it really became about like, where are my props at? (laughs) What are my props? Yeah. And I just think the energetic container of it is so sexy. I think that one of the things that I've found the most sexy about, you know, allowing, offering, begging another person to have control over me in some way is just waiting to see what they will offer, waiting to see what they will ask of me, waiting to see what opportunity will be afforded me to discover about my own self, you know, exactly um, within the confines of their boundaries and desires. That's so, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what are you loving most about your work right now? The thing that I'm loving the most is the healing aspect. And that has a lot of different permutations of how it looks, but I love when a client comes into the space looking to work on something, heal something, or maybe even not, maybe just coming in with curiosity and then having an experience that opens their body up, that gives them a new perspective, that helps them break through a block that they didn't even know they had. Those moments are what tell me that I'm on the right path. Those moments make the work just so rich and full of life and gratification and fulfillment those moments and those clients show me that I'm on the right path. That's awesome. Yeah. When you say opens the body up, do you yeah. mean literally like energetically <laughs> kind of both maybe? Yeah. Does it depend? It depends. And it can be both. When I say open the body up, what I'm usually talking about is kind of hearkening back to our chakra system and talking about people creating connection from root to crown. Okay. And a lot of people hold energetic blocks in their system and some of us you know actually have physical tension that surround those energetic blocks so some of us have a lot of tension in our bellies or are really closed and numb at our root and those energetic tensions can have physical manifestation Mm -hmm. and so when I talk about opening the body up I'm talking about like clearing that super highway of energy from root to crown and creating a clean path for the energy to flow throughout your body, which then creates the opportunity for higher sensation, for more embodied sexual experiences, and also just for knowing yourself on a deeper level. Okay. So beyond just like yeah. butt plug training. Okay. okay. <laughs> I never know. That's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Do you feel that? Like, do you have like feeling powers or do you have to like touch someone to know where their blockages are? Such a good question because every practitioner is different. Mm -hmm. My teacher, Lauren Harkness, we'll give her a little shout out. Love her. She's a really powerful and incredible Dakini. And she can feel someone when they walk in the room. Mm. She can feel them in her system. She's a huge feeler. For me, my gift is my energetic charge. Like I'm a pretty potent energy. You can feel me walk in the room. And for me to really understand someone's system, I usually need to be either close to them or have my hands on them, at least at this point. And I work with people on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And the way that I track them is like by reading their facial expressions, by Mm -hmm. reading their bodies. And so everyone has kind of a different superpower and a different set of skills that makes them predisposed to be great at this work. 
but it's the variety I think that makes it a super interesting space to be in. It's like all of these different practitioners with their different specialties and being a part of that and learning from those people has been really creatively inspiring. It's so cool. <laughs> okay, so building off of that, what makes you excellent at what you do? Ooh, I love that question. <laughs> let, let me brag a little bit. I think my greatest gift is in the intensity of my energetic field and I'll kind of even bring that more to the tangible I pack a punch and when I work with a client and I focus all of my energy and attention on that person it's quite a potent experience and that energy can come in the form of high eroticism mm -hmm. like a lot of sensuality and a lot of like mm. and it can come in the form of stern strict sadistic <laughs> dom energy and everything in between. And so where I am now, at first that energy was just constantly pouring out of me all the time, which mm -hmm. was impactful and erratic. Yeah. And so the last, you know, many years have been about honing that energy and learning how to both calibrate it and access it yeah. for certain objectives, right? For certain clients, for certain moments, for certain experiences. And so now I can really, like a mixologist, <laughs> turn on like a little of this, a little of that, a little of this. You know, it's a mixture of being an actress and a healer and, uh, you know. A writer on the fly. Yeah. You're like literally creative. writing scenes for people. And also just to speak to my tiny slice of personal experience yeah. with you, like you have some skills, like yes. literally just... I've only experienced flogging from mm -hmm. you, but I experienced a good amount of it. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you got a high dose of yeah, flogging. I did. I did. I had like delicious bruises from it, even though I was wearing pants. And like, I've been a flogger and also a floggy of people who don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, like I'm in the learning space and you have skills. What other actual tangible skills do you have? Yeah. I mean, the skills are a set or a toolbox that yeah. keeps on growing. And yeah. so I'm always adding new things to the mix. Flogging is a favorite for sure. And I have an array of impact play that I work with. Mm -hmm. I have lots of tools. I just brought in a whip, little <gasps> single tail that Damn. is very hot. <laughs> and I've been bringing that into the work. I do bondage work. Uh, I've been playing with Shibari lately and really finding that space fascinating and intimidating and yeah. It turns me on, yeah. <laughs> all the things. Amazing. And so rope bondage is coming in. And, you know, the hard skills are, there's such a variety. It really depends on the preferences of clients. Like when I know that a client likes something that maybe I don't do, I'm very motivated to learn it. Totally. But for me, I think the psychological aspect of both the Tantra work and the BDSM work is where I really shine in truly creating a thematic experience, right? And so from putting the scene together to actually taking someone into an experience of eroticism, fear, humiliation sometimes, mm. like that psychological aspect, I guess you would call them soft skills, but really playing with the human psyche in a responsible way is very intricate work. And yeah. so I think that set of skills that maybe I can't like take and swing around is certainly a favorite as well. Okay, one more little follow-up question yeah. on the note of your excellence. Your eyes are insanely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you use them to just stare at people or like are they do you experience them as powerful? And for our listeners who can't see on camera, <laughs> Madeline has incredibly beautiful piercing blue eyes. Not like an evil villain sort of way, just like beautiful ones. Do you use Thank them? You. Are they part of your superpower? Thank you. So do you also. I think we're yeah. having some some great. eye play Mine. on the <laughs> Stare your eyes, being like, whoa. It's nice. <laughs> yes, I use them a lot. I use both my eyes and my voice, I would say, as primary tools. There's a lot that can get delivered in a really direct, penetrating stare. There's a lot that can get activated by bringing the tone of your voice up and down. And that's something that I've studied. Like, hypnotic vocalization is a part of my practice. And so, you use what you got, <laughs> first and foremost. It's important, too, because it's like, I, yes, I have eyes. Yes, I have a voice. Half the time I'm using it like a screechy, funny child, you know, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm like figuring out all those things about power. Can you tell us now 
what is your professional origin story? Like, how did you get here doing all these things? Yes. Yes. I love telling this story because it wasn't only a professional origin story. It was also a huge personal healing journey. I found this work when I was in my 20s, in my mid-20s, and I was very desperate for help. I was in a long-term relationship and cohabitating with a partner and had completely lost all sensation, all sexual and erotic sensation. I was numb. Wait, like and physically, emotionally, both? Physically. Damn. Physically. Yeah, physically numb. And I, of course, when that happens to you, you automatically think there's something physically wrong with me. There's a physical manifestation happening in my body. It must be a physical problem. And I went to doctors. I went to gynecologists. I saw therapists. And none of them could really pinpoint the source of this. And I got invited to a conscious sexuality retreat that I went to on a whim. It was absolutely not in my field or in my practice or something that would normally speak to me. And I did it because I, you know, got a little intuitive pinch that I should. And at that retreat, I met my teacher, Lauren, and she was the first person to tell me that the problem might be energetic. Whoa. that the block might be energetic. And even over the course of those couple of days, I started to feel through the exercises we were doing, through the work that she physically did on my body, that something was shifting. Like I didn't experience a breakthrough, but something was moving. And so I, being the deep diving extremist that I am, I, I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I bought a one-way ticket to New York and basically just showed up on her doorstep and was like, hello, <laughs> I want to work with you. I want to learn from you. I want to heal with you. I think that this work could be the thing that gets me through this moment that takes me through this like very physical, very hauntingly awful experience mm -hmm. that I'm having. And we worked together for a couple months in a really immersive, directed way. And I started to gain sensation back in my body through a mixture of body work and then practices that she was giving me to do as homework. I started to feel sensation start to come back. And after six months of working with her, I not only was feeling more sensation in my body than I had ever felt, but I was feeling the positive impact of turn on and pleasure and orgasmic energy throughout my day throughout my life I get it I was like getting turned on by my work I was getting turned on by life itself I'm getting turned on by a delicious meal whereas I couldn't even get turned on in sexual experiences months before I'm like mm, this cheesecake <laughs> like just, it changed my life in the most welcome way and that's really what sparked coming to the tantra work generally uh, it took me years to claim it as a profession. At first, I thought it was just like a very sexy hobby. And I kept training. I trained and trained and trained. And I followed her path all the way through. And she introduced me to another teacher and started specializing. And the next iteration of coming into the profession is a different different story. But that was the seed wow. where I really felt the power of the work. Okay, I do want to hear the second chapter. But I also just want to say, listeners, all of you who write to me that are like, I'm turned off, I'm this, I'm that, or just even people in my life who are listening here, like when you're like, why do you like everything so much? I don't know why. I don't know the answer for myself, but I'm like, those sensations, like I've always been like, mm, oh, it's delicious. I love everything. And people are like, why are you so much? And yeah. I think I just am a feeler. Are you able to modulate that for yourself? Do you want to? Do you ever need to tamp it down? Because I think my problem my whole life, is I'm, I've been like, oh, I can't be too much. Oh, sorry. I really enjoy everything. Let me just... <laughs> I'll try not to fuck everybody. Like, <laughs> you know, like, how do you kind of manage that? For yes, yourself? I did. I did need to learn to once again, right. like, calibrate and use the dial. I'll never forget. I went through a really intense summer, summer of 2019. I'll never forget it. Where I had honed my skills. I'd done several trainings. My body was like lit up like a Christmas tree. And I was on Mars. I, I was just feeling so much all the time. My self-pleasure practice was like at a just all-time high. 
And I felt amazing. I felt like, you know, like I was walking on air, but I was not grounded. I used to have a practice of recording voice memos Mm -hmm. after my self-pleasure sessions because I felt so creatively inspired. The ones from 2019 are bananas. Like, I hope they go into my book one day, but they're they're very rich. I would love to hear those. (laughs) And that's around the time that I started learning calibration. Okay. And went to my teacher and just said, I feel amazing and I can't sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. And she really helped me. She, she was like, okay, now it's time for the fine-tuning work. Yeah. And that's really when we started okay. to learn, you know, the subtlety and the nuance of energy work. Amazing. Yeah, because I'm like, I, my dopamine baselines are too high sometimes. <laughs> I need to calm down. Okay, so chapter two, like, what was the next iteration of getting yeah. into the BDSM work? Yeah, the BDSM work was its own journey. And I really came to that work sort of organically from my own personal interests. I'm like, "Mm, Mm -hmm. spank me, choke me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like to explore these dynamics. Mm -hmm. But what really pushed me deeper into the space was a really challenging romantic relationship that I went through where there were a lot of wacky power dynamics that were happening on the surface, that were happening just below the surface, and that were happening totally in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And as equipped as I was as an energy worker and a tantrika, I couldn't navigate these waters. Mm -hmm. I felt really out of my depth. And when the relationship ended, I really turned to BDSM as a personal healing modality. And I happened into a course where I was getting trained as a professional, once again, doing a training for my own healing that also led me into the work. And so it was a certification program. And I started the course saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with this work. And I ended the course saying, I'm announcing myself as a dom. (laughs) So it was a really deep, powerful container that I used to understand myself. That I used to understand, you know, what unintentional power dynamics am I creating in my life? And do I like them? Am I into these? Which ones am I opting into consciously? (laughs) And which ones would I like to opt out of? And so it helped me have some agency. Opt out of or shift even. Are you able to shift like in personal life relationships? Like, are you like a power dynamics ninja now? Or like, how does it work? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I'm a power dynamics ninja yet. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) But I would say I'm very skillful Mm -hmm. with both shifting and creating dynamics. A big part of my work is around polarity, Mm -hmm. especially with couples. I love to do the polarity work with couples because couples are often experiencing imbalance of, you know, either someone is always in their masculine and needs the chance to flip into their feminine or there's an imbalance between the power dynamics of the couple. There's a lot that can happen in that space that is usually polarity related Mm -hmm. that needs to be rebalanced or or shifted. And so I would say I'm incredibly skillful there. And in my personal life, you know, (laughs) those who can't do teach. (laughs) In my personal life, I think it's easier to look at someone else's container and be like, oh, I'm going to do these small tweaks. I think in my personal life, I'm still shining the flashlight on the parts of my subconscious that want to be explored and how to do that in a healthy way. Like the part of me that wants to be dominated, how can she get explored without being in a relationship that is disempowering? And so it's just about bringing intention and consciousness to the space. It's like shining a flashlight. Then you get to see what's in the room. Like what's in this dusty, shadowy corner? I love that. Yeah. I love that. I feel like my version of it right now is like, I see the room and I can describe the room very clearly and I do it in words that don't support the relationship. Whereas Mm. I'm now learning that after interviewing hundreds of people about their sex lives, A, I learned I'm a little bit different and B, I learned that a huge part of sex and romance is the unspoken. And Mm. while that makes me wildly uncomfortable in many cases because I'm like, but that's how it gets rapey. I'm learning some of those nuances yeah. and like looking at, at my own shadowy corners. But that's a digression. And I would love to hear more yeah. about 
a day in the life or a week in the life mm. or a month in the life. You travel, you are in different yeah. cities, you see people online and in person. You work with couples yeah. and solo yeah. people yeah, absolutely. of all genders. Mm -hmm. All genders. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, I think the practice is always evolving. And sometimes it looks like a lot of in-person session work. And sometimes it's mostly on Zoom. Mm. And so it's in a place where I have the freedom to fit it to my life and the way that I move through the world. And so I am bi-coastal. I travel between New York and L.A. I have a client base in each city. And I'm also on the move. You know, I'm in, I'm in Mexico City and then I'm in Paris. And so I do my best to find clients or work with people who are similarly flexible and mobile when I can. And then I have my home bases. And that work is different with every session. I, I say that I create bespoke containers yes. and I really do. Even to the level of, you know, how many sessions I think a person should have in order to work on a specific thing. Yeah. And for the in-person work, it's a lot of, you know, experiencing the somatics. So it's everything from breath work to movement exercise to tantric massage and really activating the body. And then the virtual work is, again, implementing some of those practices, but also integrating mm -hmm. these experiences. Mm -hmm moving through coaching work, talking about the somatic experience as it relates to your everyday life. And so that's where my training lies and that's where it's led me. But every time I do a new training or I learn something new or I meet a new teacher that I inevitably become obsessed with, then I get the opportunity to expand that skill set and add something new into the mix. Amazing. How are people finding you and how are you kind of like filtering who is a good fit for you as a client? People are finding me more often through word of mouth than through anything else. I'm still in that phase where I have, again, a broad community and a global community, and they share my work. People find me on Instagram very often. Mm -hmm. And that has been the method of working thus far, is just being present online, talking about my work in community, and seeing who comes to me from there. Usually the right clients will self-select. They'll find me. They'll pull on a thread. They'll hear me, you know, talk on a podcast. Yeah, yeah. And they'll make their way to me. And it's been a really effective kind of first chapter of business. That's so cool. Yeah. What are some of the reactions that you get when people learn what you do? Yeah. A uh, wide variety. <laughs> a wide variety. People are curious. People are interested. Some people know a lot about the space, and so they really lean in and want to talk about it. But I also experience judgment, and I experience people feeling intimidated by the work or feeling like it's too woo-woo and it's too out in left field and they need a little bit more science to go with their spirituality. <laughs> it's really the range. And something that I tell myself often is, I don't need to be for everyone. My potency is my power. Mm -hmm. And so being true to my work and true to my particular style of work is what will lead me to the right clients. And being diluted and palatable and for everyone is, first of all, not my style <laughs> at all. But it's also not an effective way to reach people in the place they need to be reached. Yeah. That's when we get generic and boring and then everyone's just doing the dance instead of exploring yeah. their sexy authenticity. Absolutely. Okay, so on that note, what are the sexiest and least sexy parts of your work? And you could also translate that as like favorite, least favorite. Yeah. But like what are the parts <laughs> that really turn you on? Yeah. I mean, the parts of my work that turn me on the most are twofold. The creative side, I'm a creative director by trade before these days. And so for me, the creative exploration of building a scene, creating a session, putting together the smells and the lighting and the, you know, artistry of the moment and the type of verbiage I'm going to use, the type of archetype I'm going to embody, it really is such a creative exploration and there's so much turn on for me in that. I'm making playlists, I'm making mood boards, I'm really activated as a creative as I set up these 
scenes and sessions and workshops, the workshops especially, the events, it all just sparks me in that category. And I think also the work itself is hot and radical and amazing. And whether I'm embodying the mother, right, and I'm bringing in a lot of loving, nurturing energy, or I'm embodying the enchantress and I'm coming in like wild and sexy and like magician vibes, or I'm bringing in the dom and coming in in like a stern, strict way. All of the above are such opportunities for erotic energy to come through me and for erotic energy to come through my clients in whatever way it wants to. So I think that is the sexy part. (laughs) What about the (laughs) turn-offs? There are a lot of unsexy parts to this work. And I hope someone, I don't think it's me, but I hope someone at some point writes a book a series of short stories, something about the unsexy, unglamorous side. I think about it a lot when I'm in New York because I'm running around the city. I'm moving from place to place. Like I'm going to a meeting during the day and then I've got a scene at night. And so I'm in like a Starbucks bathroom, like zipping myself into my latex and in the summer, in the heat, just sweating through the city, like bustling to it. It's just to carry everything. (laughs) Totally. Carrying up just a bag full of floggers and toys and tools. It's so heavy. (laughs) It's so heavy. (laughs) And it's life. When this is your business, Mm. it's also becomes enmeshed with your life. And life can be quite unsexy. (laughs) Life can be really messy and ungraceful and unglamorous. And it's funny to see that combined with this work that people think of as like, Ooh, sexy, mystical. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, if a limo, like a hover limo could just drop me <laughs> off at each location, I could just like show up and do the thing, but people and don't realize. Like, Ta-da! And I'm like, yeah. no, sometimes there's a subway involved, yeah. especially during rush hour. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, no, no, I had to plug in everything and set it up and put the lights and do the things yeah, and we're exactly. going to edit it later. It's like a, a lot. Okay. We talked about shame a little bit earlier, yeah. but what have you noticed about other people's sex-related shame through your work? There's a lot of it. Yeah. There's so much of it. And that is probably the strongest through line when it comes to my mission is eradicating shame. I always say shame smashing because I think it sounds fun, like whackable, and I'm like, imagine it popping. But as a dominant practitioner, there's also ways to play with it. Oh, absolutely. In order to smash or destroy or whatever, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where it's really fun to play with the intersectionality of this work because you can come at it from a few different angles. If someone's experiencing shame, I can come in as my sweet, loving Dakini and I can work with them on, you know, energetically releasing that. And we're doing, we're talking about it. We're doing breath around it. We're taking them gently into their experience of shame and allowing them to release it. But The other side of that coin is coming at it by just absolutely immersing in it, expanding and exploding it. There's the soft way and then there's the hard and effective way. Like you notice it's happening you're like, do it for me. Yeah. You call it out. You call it into the scene. I mean, there are people who want to experience humiliation, objectification, who want to come into a place that feels shameful and allow themselves to experience that shame in a safe container with a practitioner who can help them release it. And there are lots of different techniques that I'll use to help someone release their shame. But first, we gotta we gotta shine the flashlight on it. We have to find it. Well, that's my question. How do you recognize it? I'm not sure I do. So I think I live in a funny bubble where people seem to be less shamed sure. around me. Like when I go places, people don't seem shy, or maybe I'm just not clocking it or a combination. Yeah. How do you know it's there? I Aside just, from someone like shutting down and being like, yeah. I'm ashamed. I sense it. I can really feel it. It can feel dark. I normally, now I'm like going into where I experience it. I, I feel it in people's solar plexus and their okay. bellies most often. And it just feels like thick, heavy energy. It can feel like a total void. It can mm-hmm. feel like, oh, I don't feel anything there like numbness. And people will also describe it somatically. 
Some people have pain in their bellies. Some people have tightness okay. that they can't release. Like people with really tight cores yeah. are often protecting a bubble of shame. Fuck. And then people will also just get flooded with the emotion during session. And if I see something come over them, I see their face change. I see them shift. I'll ask, like, what's your experience right now? And people often are at the level at that point of feeling comfortable to share, wow, I'm really feeling shame right now. Damn. I'm really feeling, like, disgusted with myself. And that's a really potent moment to go in and be with that person and help alleviate that, whether it's through breath, whether it's through energy, whether it's through talking them through it, whether it's through whispering affirmations in their ear. There's a lot of different ways to play with it. But that's the point that we'll call the molten state. And that's really where body alchemy was born. Because this idea that we're taking our bodies, we're creating a furnace, we're turning the heat all the way up, and then what wants to come out? Sometimes it's the shame that wants to come out and it just wants to spill out into the scene. And so that's the opportunity when you're at that molten state to transform the shame into something else. Wow. That literally, I mean, that is alchemical. Like, that's so magical. Yeah. I've been trying to figure out taboo. Are yeah. taboo and shame related? Like, what do you think? Taboo induces shame. Taboo induces shame. And yeah. people, people kind of like it. So there's like a delicious aspect yeah. to it. Well, we were talking about Carolyn Elliott and yeah. existential kink earlier. People like experiencing the unconscious parts of themselves that they don't typically get to experience. It's still in us, even if we're ignoring it and turning a blind eye mm -hmm. to it. And I think that is a big reason that people like to experience taboo, is there's some part of them that feels or has previously felt in conflict mm -hmm. with that thing, whatever it is, with that topic. And the exploration of that is something that the psyche deeply craves. It wants to make the unconscious conscious. Yeah. And so... It'll find ways to do it, and taboo is definitely one method of exploration. I feel like I'm, like I feel like I crossed the bridge, and I'm like, "What taboo? What do you mean? I love everything." Yeah. And then I'm like, "Am I humiliated right now? You're just peeing on me. So what? You know?" And, and then I'm like, "Oh, I don't know. <laughs> totally." <laughs> do you feel comfortable sharing how your work has influenced your own sex life? Yes. And I think I'm still also sorting that out, how my work oh, is influenced. I'm sure it's ongoing for the rest of forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two things I've noticed. One is that it gave me so much more toys on the playground. Mm. There were so many more things I wanted to try and new techniques, new areas of exploration, things I didn't think that I liked that I now realize I love. <laughs> and so... It definitely broadened my spectrum of possibility and discovery, pleasure, desire. And I've also become really discerning about who I let into my energetic field. And I realized that dating is a lot harder now. <laughs> totally. It's so hard. I, I realized that I have more specificity in terms of the type of people that I want to engage with romantically and the ways that I want to engage. And also, you know, what I'm available for. Yes. Because if I do engage in something that's low frequency, it then is going to carry into my work. Yeah. And so there's all these implications now. I found that, especially in the last few months, I've been grieving a breakup intentionally not dating, coming out of that and feeling vibrant and sexy and like, I'm ready. And realizing that the pool for me has shrunk significantly. Damn. Because I don't want to be my lover's teacher. You know? Me too. I do. I'm like, how do I know so much more than, oh, okay, I guess that's yeah. what happens when you research for five years about sex. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I don't like to take my lovers into these spaces that I know so much about, but I want to also be with someone who can lead. Yes. And I feel like I carry a lot of dominant energy now. Duh. I'm, I'm a dom. <laughs> and so even, I don't need to be with someone who's like trained in BDSM and Tantra. I won't say no to it. Yeah. It's just about looking, finding, immersing in communities where they exist. But for me, I've found that 
dating post transitioning into this type of work and am truly single, truly single and dating for the first time in six or seven years. Yeah. It's a different world. I really yeah. like that. It's not that I don't ever want to teach my lover or partner anything. Yeah. It's I don't want the same energy happening in what I normally get paid for to be in my private life. Beautifully said. Because at what point, like, how do I filter? You know, yeah. all of the messages that I get from strangers that are like, hi, I'm going to be in your area. Do you want to go out? And I'm like, but like, a, you're a stranger. You didn't even introduce yourself. So yeah. who are you? Why? Why? Why is the compelling <laughs> reason? Are you even a good student? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> what's the what's, what's factor here? And that's why I pinpoint, I don't want to be my lover's teacher. Yes. But. I would love to teach my lover things. Hopefully and, it's and inevitable. Back and, and back forth. and forth. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. exactly. we are, hopefully we are teaching and learning from everyone we engage with. Absolutely. You know? But it's Absolutely. like having that clear container about like, what's the agreement? What are yeah. we really doing here? Can you tell us now what the boundaries between your work and personal life look or feel like to you? Strong. Yeah, you they really them? are. Mine are opposite. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> my passion is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this. I do bring my work with me everywhere. I am constantly talking about what I do, engaging with what I do. I'm, you know, the girl at the party who's doing energy work on someone in the corner. Mm. So it finds its way. But I do create a lot of clarity around who is a client, who is a lover, who is a friend that I sometimes work with. That level of clarity, I think, is really important because it holds the sanctity of the container. I think it helps to have strong boundaries there, especially when you're bringing sexual energy into the space. Yeah. When I work on someone, there's a high likelihood that at some point during our work together, they will feel a feeling, yeah. you know, if there's an attraction already present. And if I'm like, you know, taking their body through this energetic journey of healing. And I think it's really important for my own integrity to make sure that those relationships remain held by the safety of a professional container. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for you? Like, how do you navigate those boundaries, whether it's with a client or a friend or a friend client? Like, do you explicitly say, like, here is what we are doing. Here's what's allowed. Or do you just create it alchemically somehow? Yeah, both. I, at the beginning, have negotiation, consent, we have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's accompanied by paperwork. Everyone yeah. has their preferences there. And I also hold it. I hold it during the session. And even with friends, it's kind of funny with friends because I've worked on some of my best friends. Mm -hmm. And even then, I'm holding the container ritualistically. So I'm coming in, I'm doing an intake with them, even though we kind of want to talk about what happened over the weekend or yeah. what's going on in their lives, I really maintain the container. We talk about session. I'll take them into the session space. I open the same way every time. And there's an incantation. I'm, you know, burning sage. And again, just bringing us both into this container that's very specific. We go through session, whatever that may be. It could be Reiki. It could be massage. It could be, you know, any number of things. And then we close the container together. And often I will kind of leave immediately and be like, we'll hang tomorrow. Yeah. Every now and then with a dear friend, I'm like, all right, we can have yeah. dinner. Yeah. But that ritualistic open and close is really important in establishing in this moment, I'm your teacher guide. And now we've ended that container. We've created a clear close. And now we can go back to our everyday relationship to one another. But it just helps create safety. Yeah. It's so funny because hearing you describe it, I'm like, oh, that's what I do in photography sessions. You know, and now I do yeah. mostly erotic photography. But even back when I used to do mostly portraits and headshot sessions, I had that same sort of clarity, even if it was a friend. And if I didn't, the session was trash and they didn't Messy. they didn't show up for yeah. their themselves, you know. And so that's I had to learn to do that. And I hear you. Sometimes I'm like, OK, no, bye. You, you go out the door now. And yeah. then sometimes I'm like. All right, I have yeah. enough. We can do it. We can Let's break we can the rules a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, though, because also as a photographer, you're holding that space for someone. It's intimacy. It I is. didn't realize I was doing intimacy work for years yeah. until I started doing yeah. more sex work stuff and then online sessions. And I'm like, oh, it's the same, but I could. Oh, my gosh. I've I could, been here before. I, 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 this is 
familiar. Yeah. But now I bring yeah. all my favorite things into one place. Yeah. Whoa. Definitely. <laughs> like getting to be a voyeur is the best. Yeah. And then like support people in that way. Mm-hmm. Damn. What about, do you have to deal with subcontractors? You have an assistant. Like, mm-hmm. when it comes to talking about sex with, like, other professionals, is there anything to say there? Anything that you find helpful or bumpy or is it just regular? I think that I'm also getting to that point where I'm in a little bit of a bubble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel a lot of charge around it in a professional sense. Okay. I don't feel a lot of charge when I'm talking to other professionals, when I'm explaining what I do, like, my assistant is really, and, and now she's my chief of staff, I should mm. say. She's really comfortable with the work. Explaining it to her was very easy. I think I'm lucky in that when I started my practice, especially in New York and L.A., these metropolitan cities, tantric work, BDSM, all of these spaces were starting to get illuminated. And so there was less work for me to destigmatize in every conversation I had, it was much more accepted than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to have to jump off a cliff. Mm. And it's like, I jumped off the cliff, but then the ground was just like two or three feet below. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I'm fine. And it's a trampoline. (laughs) (laughs) Boing, boing, boing. That's awesome. Okay, can you tell us now what you've learned about social and or cultural norms through your work that has either surprised you or that you would like to shift or both? Mm. I mean, many. There are many norms that I would like to shift in the way that people relate to one another and in the way that people relate to this work. And I think the big one that feels so obvious, I have to say it, is shifting the stigma around sex work, sex education, sex, everything in the professional realm. And it really only took me a few months into my practice to see how valuable this work is and the healing capability of it that really doesn't exist in any other type of interaction. And, you know, I know that from my little sliver of the industry. And I also now can see how that extrapolates out across the industry because there are things that I don't offer and I don't engage sexually with my clients. And so I now see just from my vantage point how the full spectrum of this work is valuable, is super necessary, like must exist. I feel like my activist is really activated and emphasized by just that understanding. Yeah. Damn. I've been interviewing a lot of ladies who work at brothels and I'm like, if that were only covered by healthcare. (laughs) Like, we'd be in such a different space. Like, having that intimacy and, like, having someone like you who can help unblock whatever shit, you know, because just because someone goes to a brothel doesn't mean they're having a transcendent experience if they're blocked as fuck. But, like, Loneliness is an epidemic. And people are feeling more isolated and lack connection in a way that they never have before. That's where we are in our digital world, it's post-pandemic, it's, you know, due to many factors, but that has more implications on mental health and physical health than our society is willing to recognize. Yeah. And so... Yeah, we can barely talk about mental health. Yeah, barely, (laughs) barely. And so talking about relational health, it's just, you know, it's given such little airtime when it has such huge impact on our physical bodies. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like the conversations about technology and screens are only kind of like niggling around the edges too. And I'm like, and and I also am like, it's fine if you're in the virtual space and you're spending thousands of dollars to create your erotic role play avatar and you're going to like explore your queerness that way. That's cool, but like, are you also getting touched? I yeah. I'm a person that thinks that human bodies need to get touched, but that's that's what I need. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Since you began this work, have you noticed any sex-related trends in your areas of industry, like either in your own business practice or personal life or just at large? Definitely. Everybody's at least a little kinky and everybody's maybe a little gay. <laughs> Those are the right. trends. Right. Yes. Damn. Yes. <laughs> and, and I don't say that to discount the straight people. Totally. Bless. You're real. You're, You're real and we are not erasing you. And there is a lot more 
queer curiosity and kink curiosity than our society at large would have you believe. Can we say the word queriosity? Is that queriosity? <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I'm seeing so much of it. I'm hearing so much about it. There's a lot of desire for exploration in both of those areas. And those are big trends. And I recently was in Miami and I was in a room full of people. (laughs) I asked them to close their eyes and imagine the weirdest, freakiest, most taboo thing that they desire to do. That is it. That is a turn on for them. That is a kink for them. And I invited them to come tell me later as a secret. (laughs) And I'm not telling anyone secrets today, so don't even. (laughs) It was such a fun exercise. And the point in asking everyone to do that and to close their eyes and to go to that place is everyone in that room had a weird thing or something that they considered to be weird. Was it? Yeah, I was going to say, was it really weird? How much could it be? They had a non mainstream, what felt to them like an edgy, maybe shadowy. All of them had a non-mainstream because then that means that our weird stuff is mainstream. It's just unique, right? That was the point. Okay. (laughs) That was the point of the exercise. Wow, you did it perfectly. When people are like, oh, I'm shy. I couldn't possibly tell you my deepest, darkest. I'm like, no, everyone has it. What's the, no, it's okay. I talked about this with people. No, you can tell me, you know, and (laughs) And I never push people, but like. And that's the point. What are we also shy about? Is that all of this fringe stuff, like the stuff that we feel we can't talk about, maybe we only tell our therapist and maybe not even our therapist. Most people don't tell their therapist that I talk to. (laughs) That is all very normal human desire behavior. And if I could send one message out into the world, it would be that. It would be the kink that you want to explore or the secret sexy desire that you can't tell your partner, or the the rupture that you're experiencing in your relationship, or the issue you think that is totally unique to you is actually universal. Mm. So many people are sharing your experience. You are not alone. There's people out there to do the weird sex stuff with you. There are people out there to help you heal and explore. And that's what I think people are missing when they feel stuck in their eroticism or stuck in their sexuality is they feel really alone. They feel like their experience is unique to them, that it's a dysfunction in some way. And so once again, it's just, it comes back to eradicating that shame. I've been wondering lately if it's just part of the human experience, because I was like, yeah, we'll smash all the shame and then it won't be there and it'll be perfect. And then I'm like, oh, but without shadow, it's all just blinding light. So like, Mm -hmm. do you think people can it enjoy their kinky weird parts without that sort of like cultural like oh it couldn't possibly you know what I mean yeah I think they can and I think that nothing ever becomes 100% blinding light but it's like the journey of scraping away the shame maybe is part of the pleasure because you're right we're never going to get to like purity in this human world yeah I think Scraping away the shame, alchemizing the shame is part of the pleasure. I also think accepting the shame is part of the journey too. It's not all about like dissolving and smashing and breaking. Sometimes it's about accepting the fact that I am experiencing shame in this moment. Which requires noticing. Which requires being aware of it. It requires the willingness to look at it and accept it. And that's why you hear a lot of talk around shadow work being an acceptance of your shadow, Mm. not a dissolution or an eradication of your shadow, but an acceptance of it. And sometimes part of that acceptance is also accepting the fact that you feel shame in moments. Mm. We like to alleviate it. We like to bring it up and out. And a lot of my work does focus there, but it also focuses on self-acceptance, even in the shadow, even the yucky parts or the low frequency parts we accept those too damn lately i've just really been noticing my degradation kink like she's everywhere i'm like there she is again there she is again you know i'm just trying to make her more conscious in all these ways i'm like damn okay well well, at least we're playing together yeah (laughs) you recently were in miami for something fucking cool will you tell us about Uh, it yes yes and i get to shout out a team that i love so much 
called Unbound Ritual, which is a Shibari collective of really amazing artists. And I came in and joined them as their sensual dominant <laughs> performer creative and came in and did a scene at this event and then also spoke on a panel on conscious kink <gasps> and really diving into what led me to the space along with several other really talented, interesting, intelligent people. And it was a showcase of sorts. It was a night of artistry and performance and conversation and sapiosexuality. And it really opened me up to what is possible in these sensual and sexual spaces. It opened me up to what's possible in play spaces. Mm. It doesn't all have to be about sex acts. It mm. can be about an exploration of the erotic. And I think we see more and more of that popping up and out and coming into the light. But it felt really beautiful to be a part of it. Yeah. And I know that we'll continue that collaboration. But it really came to life in Miami. That it came to life. So awesome. Yeah. And I love calling out or highlighting that bit about sex acts are not the same thing as eroticism. They can be part of it. Yeah. Completely. I think I think that's a lesson I've been learning too. The more I'm like, what do you like? What do you like? What's yeah. hard about it to you? Because for me, oftentimes they are so intertwined because I'm just like, I'm here. I'm in it. What would you say you're most excited to explore or grow in your work going forward? Ooh. I am very excited to build curriculum. That has been where I've been over the last six months is in this really deep creative portal is what I'll call it. I've been writing almost every day. Oh, I'm excited and... <laughs> for you to build curriculum. It's coming. It's not here yet. We are in the gestation period. My yes. belly is full. I feel it growing and forming and taking shape. There are a couple of different courses that want to come out. There's one on polarity, which I know I've mentioned a couple of times, on helping reestablish polarity between the divine masculine, divine feminine. Not everyone likes those terms. So I also use Shiva and Shakti, dominant, submissive. What we'll explore in the course is that a lot of those are kind of similarly grouped energetics. And it's about reestablishing polarity in your relationship, but also within your own body. Mm -hmm. So how are you balancing your own Shiva Shakti energy? And that one is, it's in the ether, it's coming through. I think the more, the more immediate piece that I'm building and that actually is already out in practice, I'm taking clients through it one-on-one -on -one, and then I will release it into the wild as a course or a live workshop series yeah. on heartbreak alchemy mm. and working through the stages of heartbreak. My teacher tells me and told me at the beginning of my practice when I was wondering where to specialize, where do I put my attention? Where do I put my energy? What do I teach? Why do I teach it? She said, you don't have to do that much work. It's actually pretty simple. Listen to the field. Listen to what comes to you. Listen to what people are asking you. And your own experience will dictate where you work. And she was very right on both counts. This is the thing that people are coming to me the most often for. And this is the journey that I just went on. I just took myself through this program very intentionally yeah. and documented it, the entire process. And so to bring it out into the world and to see people start benefiting from it has been so gratifying and exciting. And it's not just for breakups. It's not for people. It's, it's yes, for people who are going through heartbreak from romantic partnership, but also people who have lost a loved one, people who are grieving a parent that's sick that hasn't yet passed, people who are, you know, feeling heartbreak after losing a job. Yeah. There are many, many ways the heart can break. And I think as a society, we don't bring enough intentionality to the way those breakups happen. Yeah. And it leaves a lot of mangled hearts. Absolutely. We don't have rituals for it. We don't have spaces to acknowledge it. I think you know, living in Los Angeles, being a headshot photographer for years, going yeah. to film school, being in spaces with actors, people don't know how to grieve as their dreams transition, as their desires 
evolve. And so it's that's Truth. beautiful work yeah. we need. Oh, I'm yeah. so excited. I should be past versions of yourself as yeah. well. Yeah. That's a huge piece. Yeah. Yeah. And noticing it as it's happening. Like, yeah. oh, man, I can't wait for your classes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very excited. So now if you could wave a magic wand and teach everyone in the world something about sex, what would it be? Slow down and breathe. <laughs> That's it. There's a lot of disembodied sex happening out in the world. There's a lot of disembodied people. Don't I know it? Yeah, right? I, I mean, have felt it. <laughs> Once you recognize it, you can't unsee it as you move through the world. And we are so mind focused and mind centric that a lot of us have evacuated our systems. A lot of us have evacuated our systems so that we don't have to experience certain emotions or depths mm -hmm. of emotion or due to trauma. There's lots of good reasons mm -hmm. that we don't choose to inhabit ourselves. But what it does in sexual experiences is it really limits the potential for connection. It limits the potential for pleasure. And it also keeps us disconnected from the process and from the act and from the experience and from the other person mm -hmm. in a way that we deeply desire to be connected. So we're cutting ourselves off from this thing that we really crave. Yeah. So yeah. that's my magic wand oh, moment. I, I would just it. drop us into our, our bodies, all yeah. of us, just <laughs> and then create the level of support that's needed to facilitate that experience. Yeah. Because sometimes dropping into the body after being disconnected from it for a very long time can be an intense experience. And so I'll, I'll bring light to that too, that illuminating that space can also be intense. And mm -hmm. so seeking support when you're in that process is really important. And communities yeah. of support yeah. too. I exactly. wish I wish everyone had a community yeah. where they could feel safely held no matter what emotion is coming up. And we had like feelings doulas and then the touch ones, all of it. Really? Damn. Are there any other sex stories you can share that you find inspiring? You you did an inspiring one at the beginning, but yeah. anything else you can leave us with that is like a, an experience you had related to your work that mm. people might be inspired by? I feel like every client is a little anecdote of inspiration. What feels really present for me right now is my work with men. I work with all genders. I work with couples. But especially in the last few months, I've had a few key men in my practice that have just made these quantum leaps mm -hmm. in their own level of comfortability around intimacy and like what they're feeling in their own systems, their hearts have opened. And there's something really tender about that work as a woman and as a woman who's been enmeshed in women's work for the last decade for my own personal practice and healing. There's been something really special and sexy and fun and inspiring and like deeply moving about watching the masculine come online, wake up, heal, really like go to these deep sexual vulnerable spaces. Because it's not always what I experience in my personal life. You know, as a practitioner and a woman, those are two different things. Mm -hmm. Recently, I worked with a widower whose wife had passed away years prior and he had not been intimate in a very long time. And that was a really moving experience. I think both of us shed tears by the end of it. Just like reconnecting his body with touch, mm -hmm. reconnecting his heart, really kind of moving into this very gentle, very soft session that was just about like being in the presence of a woman mm -hmm. and sharing space and receiving touch receiving even just like a hand on the cheek can be so meaningful very intimate yeah very intimate and i felt so honored to hold that space and even though this man was much older than me i really felt the eroticism fill the space and it was so telling that it doesn't all have to be about sex like but it all is in it, and it all is it all has to be, and it all doesn't have yeah. to be, and it's so much broader yeah. than the spectrum that we're used to playing in, yeah. and there's so much erotic to be had in, like, the graze of a hand, mm -hmm. in eye contact, and in sexual touch, all of it, 
is a yes. And so, I don't know, my dudes, my yeah. dudes are really inspiring me lately from the sessions that are fun and sexy and playful and we're discovering new things. I'm tying up a guy in Shibari because he's never felt tied before. He's never felt that it's containment oh, Wow. to, you know, guiding a man through a recent heartbreak and yeah. letting him be a puddle and express that raw emotionality and cry and be vulnerable and be in his tender place that he doesn't feel like he has the ability to access. Like all of it is feeling just so juicy and so aligned and sexy. It's hot. It's hot. Dudes, we want your vulnerability. (laughs) We celebrate your tears. Yes. And as I was listening to your talk, I was thinking about how for the past, I don't know, my adult life, I've been confused because I'm like, okay, wait, there's these narratives about men are stoic and shut down. I see that happen in groups. I see kind of like the broad strokes of that. But my experience with any dude one-on-one is that they're super feeling. And I have yeah. learned that this is not the experience that everyone has. Yeah. And that there's something about me that creates permission. And, you know, I, looking back on all my work, because, like, photography led to sex stories. Like, all of my work as yeah. an artist, I was like, wow, in my one-on-one work with people as a photographer, people end up really opening up to me a lot. And then that was, like, the same time that my friends were getting married and not sharing their details, and I fucking love them. And yeah. now I'm looking back, and I'm like, well... There I was one-on-one with them, holding space for them, literally telling them what to do so they didn't have to worry, and then, like, touching their temples as I brush back their hair or, like, arranging their shirt and asking all the while, but, like, holding space. And I'm like, "Hmm, maybe that had something to do with it. And, you know, I used to work with pickup artists and with these men who were here to try to be better, to try to make connections. And for, like, a decade, my mom has been like, but I think you should give people relationship advice. Why don't you just help them? You you have so much knowledge and so many skills. And I've been like, nope, 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 nope. That's not what I do. And then like yeah. you were saying, it's like people always come to me and ask for advice. And I'm like, I'm single. I don't know. But then I tell them stuff and it works. And so it's like, it finds you. And yeah. I just, I really don't understand the myth of like men not having feelings. They're so fucking full of feelings and they love to talk about them. And I think globally, I, if I could wave a magic wand, I just want safe spaces for sharing those feelings yeah. everywhere you know permission it permission. comes down to permission. permission for everyone yeah you know? damn that's so beautiful okay lastly madeline could you please tell us if you were going to create your fantasy playroom mm-hmm. and it can be for you personally or it could be a space you would bring clients you have an unlimited budget what are the elements of that space? What's it like? Or if you can't decide on one, maybe like what's your Mexico Ooh. one? What's your Los Angeles one? What's your New York one? <laughs> I'm like, are you limiting me with an Absolutely. unlimited budget? <laughs> that doesn't seem right. <laughs> uh, I mean, so many. I feel like I've said that for every question. And there's a lot. There's just so much variety. And I think part of the thing that turns me on and appeals to me about this space is the variety. In my previous life, I ran a marketing agency so that I didn't have to stick to one brand or one vertical. And I could be constantly tasting all of the different industries and all of these different companies and mission statements and all the things. And so I'm a variety slut. Me too. (laughs) It's the only way to be, right? (laughs) Variety is the spice of life. It is. And I always want to have a sampler platter or like bites of other people's food. Tasting menu. Cut all the chocolates open. And I mean, not anymore, but like, yeah. (laughs) I hear you. And so with that being said, I think the room that's coming to my mind right now is this Venusian gold multi-sensory space. And actually there's a space that I created alongside a beautiful partner who built this room that we called sensualism. It was a space with dancers and I was doing energy work in the space. I was also tying shibari and we had a, a musician who was drumming in the hand pan and it was this gorgeous array and cornucopia of flavors and sounds and different activities that were happening at any given moment. And that room, it was a really special night, but it lit people up and it opened their bodies up. And the people who came in and out of that space over the course of the evening had a really 
impactful experience. I was doing energy work and people were having kundalini awakenings and then in the corner someone's serving tea. And so that to me is an ideal space where you've got multiple practitioners and you have someone doing body work while someone else is singing. And then somebody else is just organically moving their body and maybe even doing like a strip tease. And then somebody else is getting flogged and someone yeah. else is getting tied in shibari and someone else is crying because they're experiencing the beauty of the moment in such a cathartic way that that's how they have to express. And I imagine beautiful food and honey and cheese and fruit and wine and just the whole like mm, you know the yes. best of every sense all five senses incorporated into this space i want to live in that i do too <laughs> energetic oh, i can't wait for us to build it <laughs> we'll start putting the pieces together beautiful damn lovers you can go to madelinepryor.com p-r-y-o-r the link is in the description madeline thank you for being mm. a guest on sex stories Yes, thank you. I had such a good time and really appreciate you exploring this topic. It's so important. It's vital. It's life-giving and it was a pleasure to be a part of it. Oh my God, it was yeah. a pleasure to listen. <laughs>